first time when I was eight years old. And that same year, I started playing music. I started playing drums. And, uh, you know, my life took a, another turn, you know. I just, uh, I love the Lord. I, I remember, um, I remember when I was young, Oral Roberts was uh, on prime time. Uh, and if the old black and white TVs, I hate to date myself that much. I, you know what I'm saying? But of course, I was just an infant back then. They weren't very big. And we used, to, we used to have to stretch the TV antenna wire all the way from the top of the mountain. We lived up on Sand Canyon, or in Sand Canyon, up on the ridge route, going into L.A. And uh, we'd stretch the cord down, and, and the TV was in my bedroom. And so when Mom would put us down for a nap, uh, I would turn on the TV and Old Roberts would be on, like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And it's like I had this love for him. You know, I, I understood what, what was going on with him. I, it's like I could understand what he was ministering. And when I saw him take the, the braces off the legs of those little kids that had polio, you know, it, it touched my heart even at 8 years old. I was really, I, I was touched by that. And, and, you know, I used to walk through, we had a, we had about five or ten acres, I don't remember, I was pretty young, but we had a swimming pool and we had a, an orchard that had pears and apples and everything down below the swimming pool. Back then we didn't have pool service, amen? We drained the pool into the orchard to water the trees and the boys cleaned the pool, amen? But anyway, we, I would walk through that orchard and I'd talk to God. And, and, and I, you know, I had such a love, but a... Just a very uh, uh, simple relationship with him. But I, you know, I guess I figured if Oral Roberts could talk to God, I could too. Amen. 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 And I would talk to God and we'd converse down there. And, and I was meaner than a junkyard dog, but I'd still <laughs> converse with Jesus. Amen. Even a little kid. And uh, I was raised in the oil field, so you can guess, you know, my, my vocabulary was very big at all. But anyway. Uh, I would talk back and forth to God, and, and uh, I, nobody ever told me. See, I, I wasn't discipled. I wasn't discipled. My parents weren't what you'd call uh, avid Christians. They loved God, but they never went to church. They never read the Bible. They didn't, they didn't uh, know how to minister the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know that I was filled with the Holy Spirit until I got uh, recommitted my life in 1980 to God. But I know back then that even back then I was filled with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit had touched me, you know, and, and I didn't say any big elaborate prayer. I just entered in with a heart that was so simple to God that, you know what, I didn't have to beg Him to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Come on. I didn't have to manifest to make Him fill me. I didn't have to do anything. I just loved God. And, I, and, and so, you know, anyway, nobody ever told me that there was another voice. So one day I was talking to God and, and this other voice said, you know, my son, when you know that all this stuff about me, I'm going to take you home. And I thought, you know, at eight years old, how many know that I had uncles that died and, and they always said they took them home. You know, God took them home. How many know at eight years old you don't want to go home? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So from that time on, I always would walk with God in my peripheral vision. I was afraid to walk face to face with God because I thought that He would take me home if I really put myself into a relationship with God. See, I think there's a lot of Christians today that walk with God in their peripheral vision, not face to face, the way He wants to walk. You follow me? Yeah. And, and you know, we're going through a time right now in our country where, you know, times are really getting serious. And it's time that we stand up as Christians. Yes. Yes. That we stand up and we begin to walk face to face yes. with God. Yes. You know, we're, we're seeing little kids, little Christian kids beheaded and stuck up on sticks. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, people beheaded for their faith. How many know that right now there's an all out war on yes. Christians? Yes. Yes. That's right. And we have some friends that minister, that have ministries in Africa that tell us to pray for them. Patrick and Sazi and a few of them that we stay in touch with, that, you know, they're, they're asking us to pray for them because they know the danger that's there. They're not shrinking back from it, but they know the danger. And you know, as Christians in America, how many know we need to stand up and, and be counted? Yes. 
we need to stand up. And and you know we have people now that want to that want to wipe out Israel. I just got back from Israel about a month ago. I went there with with Kofi and Christians United for Israel. How many have ever heard of that? It was a ministry started by John Hagee, and they asked me if I wanted to go. It was such a blessing because it only cost me five hundred dollars to go. I had to pay for my airfare down to Los Angeles and and my room at the Marriott, and then they flew me out well to to uh, uh, Tel Aviv, and we spent eight days in Israel, and it was just awesome. It changed my life. It was uh, um, an experience. That I'll never ever forget. You know, I, I uh, they took us all the way from the Golan Heights down to the Dead Sea. <clears throat> we went up. Uh, we met with uh, a colonel that was in the uh, uh, Israeli army, and up in the Golan Heights, we were up on the border of Syria. We went up there, and and uh, we were. It was happened to be snowing at the time, but we were going to go up into this area where you know they'd been fighting, and he was going to show us a little bit about what was going on and what kind of equipment the United States was giving them. And it was a tour for pastors, you know, to, to kind of get the feel of what's going on in Israel. And, and you know, we couldn't get up this road because they're in the bus because there was too much snow. And when we got back to town, we found out that they were fighting right over that hill. And they were shooting it out over there. There was a gunfight going on. And, and uh, you know, when you, when you realize when you're over there in that particular type situation, you, you don't realize when you're here in Turlock or Modesto or Silver Springs, Nevada, what it's like to have to go to bed with your gun beside your bed. You don't know what it's like to be, you know, to be threatened by somebody blowing you up for, for absolutely just being a Christian or a, a Jew. Amen? And it, it's a little bit on the scary side. I mean, it was, but it was an eye-opener for me. And, and you know, I, I just think that, that we Christians need to rise up, Amen. you know, uh, I don't want to get into politics too much, um, you know, but the thing about it is, is God gave us a mission, yeah. he called us and he has ordained this country, come he on. has ordained this country to be the policeman of the world, yeah, come on. you don't have the power that this country has, you don't have the resources that this country has. Amen. You don't have the people that this country has and not be ordained or set apart to do the things that God wants us to do. Right. Come on. And yeah. when we stand back because of whatever reason and just let things materialize in other countries and people be killed just because they're Christians, you know what? We need to stand up and we need to write the people that are in Washington, D.C. and make our statements known. Amen? Amen. 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 So, anyway, if you want, I'm going to give you some scriptures because I don't think I'm illegitimate here. But, so, how many brought their Bibles today? Anybody bring a Bible? Go to James chapter 1. And, and uh, I just want to share a few things here with you. Uh, I always thought that James might have been a pot smoker. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I don't know whether, really whether he ever smoked pot or not. But, you know, when, when I read these scriptures, I think, boy, you know. But that's what, you know, I'm joking. It says in, in James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, My brother. See, James was talking to Christians. He was talking to you and me. He wasn't just talking to a group of, of pagans or... Uh, you know, he was talking to Christians, and he says, My brethren, count it all joy. Let me go back. You know what? I'm going to say this because the God always puts on. If you go to verse 1, I like this. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many know what a bond servant is? A bond servant is somebody that was in captivity and been set free. And voluntarily went back and sat under that anointing. Amen. Went back and sat under that anointing. See, James just wasn't a random Christian. He found a place that God wanted him, and he stayed there. Yes. Yeah. He stayed under the leadership and the headship of where he was planted. Amen. See, a lot of times today, we have people that go from church to church to church to church to church. And, and you know what? They're never satisfied. They're never happy. There's always somebody does something wrong. 
Something makes them aggravated. Something gets them beside themselves. Come on. And so they go somewhere else. I have people come to me all the time sometimes in my church. They say, I think I need to be the youth pastor. I say, really? <laughs> and so we say, okay, well, why don't you start out with a children's group? So they start out with a children's group. And then about three weeks later, they say, you know, maybe God's calling me to do uh, how many know God don't change his mind? That Amen. Amen. Come on. Right. Amen. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. Come on, brother. See, a bond servant is somebody that serves God even in the hard times. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Even when things aren't going yes. the way that they want them to go, yes. they stand. And it says in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, when you've done all to stand, stand. Yeah, that's it. Yes. Come on. You know, I, I remember I was studying for a... a, a message in, in Ephesians, and I was going to preach on the armor, the armor of God. How many like that? Yeah. I do. I like the armor of God. Amen? It makes me feel good. Yes. I got the helmet of salvation, the right. breastplate of righteousness. I'm all girded up. Amen? That's right. And then one day I was, I was getting ready to do this message, and I get to verse 10, and, and it says, finally, God asked me, he said, don't you want to know how I got to the finally? No, God said that. He said, don't you want to know how I got to the final? I said, well, yeah, Lord. So keep your hand in James and turn back to Ephesians. How about that? Sounds good. Ephesians chapter 6. Here's what it says. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Yeah. How many know what a parent in the Lord is? That's not mommy and daddy. That's your pastor, your teacher. Your evangelist, whoever you put yourself under, that's who he's talking about. He's not talking about mommy and daddy, because he talks about mommy and daddy in the next verse. Right. Come on. He says, honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment with promise. It says that may, may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, <coughs> do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up with the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with lip service, not with a half-hearted, hug me on Sunday, shoot me on Tuesday. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. With sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. See, when your servant, your pastor, when your servant where you've been put, when you're when you're being faithful to what God has called you to do, you're gonna be blessed. Amen. And when you're not faithful to what God's called you to do, you're not gonna be blessed. Because that's the way he gets our attention. Remember in Hebrews chapter 12? It says, have we forgot the message of chastening, of scourging, of putting us through the fire so that we can, he can get our attention? Amen. Amen. Yeah. So he goes on and it says, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. Whatever we give God in the name of Jesus Christ, we're going to get back. That's right. Amen. That's right. You know, so many people don't believe that. I work with men all the time that have come. We've had over 25, 2,700 men, 2,800 men go through our program in the last 16 years. And a lot of those men today are pastors. Some of them are evangelists down in Mexico. Some of them are evangelists in different places. But you know what? They're serving the Lord. And they come there broken and tore up from the floor up. And they get Jesus Christ in them. And they get the power of the Holy Spirit. And they get the Word in them. Come on. They get the Word in them. See, I love worship. I'm a worshiper. Amen. I love music. But you know what? I don't just like the ooey-gooey feeling of worship. I like it when I've been given something and empowered by something and go out and do something. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I want to do something. Say do something. Do something. Amen. And it says you masters do the same thing to them. Give up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. 
And then it says, finally. So after we've done all these criteria here in, in, in uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 9, then we can get to the finally. Are you following me? Then we can put on the helmet of salvation. How many times do we go to church and we find people that are holding grudges? Come on. That are angry. That are that are don't have any forgiveness or compassion in their heart. Come on. You know, if you read Matthew 6, everybody likes Matthew. You know what it says in there? That power of prayer, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Amen? How many know if you read the Bible, you know that God doesn't lead you into temptation? You'll get there on your own just fine. <laughs> Amen? Hallelujah. But then in the very next verse, it says, If you have anything against your brother, Come on. forgive him. So that your God in heaven can forgive you. That's right. That's right. In Mark 11, how many like that prayer in Mark 11? That's one of my favorites. Ask what you will, and doubt not in your heart, and then God will get it for you. But the very next verse says, if you have ought against your brother, you better get rid of it, or your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Come on. Now I want you to just think a minute. We're not going to get into this grace issue, okay? We know God's grace. Amen? But if you're holding ought against somebody... And you go to God and you say, God, forgive me. Make me your child. And you're holding this unforgiveness in your heart. Does God have the right to grant you sonship? Just a thought. A deep thought. He says, I can't forgive you. He says it numbers of times. I can't forgive you if you don't forgive. That's right. He says, if you're not going to be my bond servant, if you're not going to be where I put you, then you're out on your own. Yeah, come on. How many know in Romans it says, who he foreknew, these he also predestined? Come on. You know what that means in the Greek? It means, he, it means perizo, that's the word. It means that God put a perimeter around our lives. And he'll let us go back and forth. And you know, somebody was talking about love here. Do you know you can't love anybody unless you have a choice not to love them? Yeah. Come on. See, God gave us a choice. That's right. He gave us a choice to do it His way or the highway. <laughs> no, that's the truth. His way or the highway. And, and for so many times, you know, we hear this message of grace. Well, you know, we're, we're covered under grace. Listen, God covered me in grace when He went to the cross. Yes, Come on. After He got out of that tomb, and how many know I was in that tomb? I walked into that tomb, and I saw the place where my Savior was laying. And I touched it, and I went to Golgotha, which is not too far, right over there. And I, how many know I had to do some business with Jesus? Come on. I had to do some business with Jesus. Yeah. Come on, brother. And I remember thinking, you know, I went to the, way, the wall, the western wall, and I put my head up against there, and I began to pray. And, and you know what the guy said when I walked out of that, away from that wall, I was like in a daze. They thought I... That, you know, I was just like, I don't even, I, I don't even know what came over me, man. It was like I was in another world. Come on, brother. But I knew I had to do business with Jesus. See, I had to do business with Jesus. And I, I don't want to fool around with That's God right. anymore. Amen. Amen. I don't want to fool right. around with Him anymore. Amen. I don't want to buy my way into some place. I don't want to, I don't want to coerce somebody into something they don't want to do. You follow me? Yeah. Good. But I'll tell you what I will do. I'll tell you the truth. Come on. I'll tell you the truth, and you know what? It doesn't matter how much praise and worship you do. It doesn't matter how much glory, glory, glory you do. It doesn't matter how much money you give away or how much your time you give away. I mean, it matters, but you know what? It's where your heart is. That's right. Come on. That's so true. It's where your heart is. Right. How are you tracking? Yeah. Yeah. I'm right on there. Come on, brother. See, there's more to being a bond servant than just a simple beginning of a chapter. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's go a little further here. James chapter 1. 
This is where I wonder a little bit about Brother James. Amen. <laughs> it says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How many know that we're going through a trial right here in America? Yes. yes. The difference yeah. is, in America, we don't even realize we're going through a trial. Amen. Come on. Right, that's a scary part. In Africa, they know they're going through a trial. Yeah. In Sudan, they know they're going through a trial. Yeah. In the Philippines, they know when they're going through a trial. They know when they're going through a trial. But you know, over here, we're blessed. We're blessed above the rest. Come on, that's true. You know true. what? If I'm hungry, I will give me some food stamps. Listen, I've been 16 years out at New Hope Recovery Ranch. When I went out there, there wasn't one Christian, one church, wasn't anybody that said, we'll help support this ministry and help you do this. Amen. They thought I was nuts. They thought I was a liar. They thought I just wanted to build my ranch. That, you know, I, I was a drilling contractor. And, and let me tell you something. If I wanted to build ranches, I could have built ranches without going to the desert. Amen, brother. Especially silver. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Amen. <laughs> so I know what it's like to not have. I know what it's like to not have. Come on. I remember we used to eat MREs out there at that ranch. We had 14, 15 men live in the house with me and Teresa for four and a half years. We shared our house with them. They lived in the front two bedrooms. We lived in the master bedroom and the master bath. How many know that that's, that's not exactly the American dream? <laughs> That ain't exactly the American dream. But you know what it was? It's where God called us to be. And you know what? We didn't shrink back when things got tough. We used to go into Reno and they'd give us some food at the mission. And there was rat poop all over. And we'd have to take it home, the cans, and clean them with, with uh, what's that, Lysol, to get all the stuff before we'd open them and eat them. We used to mix them. And you know what? God was blessing us. He'd always send us a chef. Some chef that couldn't stay sober. He'd come in our program. And they'd take this stuff. And man, it tastes like a million bucks. we take those MREs and mix some of that stuff with it. And it was good. You know, it's not that way anymore. It's not that way at New Hope Ranch anymore. Those boys eat steak. They eat chicken. They eat potatoes. We go off to a food bank that we buy our food by so much a month. We have people that are faithful, that contribute every day, not to us, but to the people that have gone through that program. And let me tell you something. You don't have to go very far around that ranch to find the fruit. Come on. Amen. That's right. That fruit is there. See, God has produced fruit. And you know what? When we screw up, he'll he'll trim us back. Yeah. He'll trim us back. Yeah. He'll he'll do a little pruning. He'll do a little cutting. He'll do a little scourging. Yeah. He'll do a little whipping. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? He's been faithful. Oh, yes. Come on. See, people talk to me about fear, fear of finances, fear of this. I had cancer. I've had you know all this stuff. The old devil. He just tries to come. And you know what? Every time, my Jesus just heads him off the pass. Every time. Every time. Every time. You know, 360 sometimes, it says, fear not. Fear not. We need to stand up, you guys. We need to look outside this room. We need to look outside our, our churches. See, the Bible says, it says that we... We are looking into a mirror dimly. But then when we walk away, we forget what we saw. We forget what God's called us to do. We start to forget because you know why? We don't hang out with people that are of like-minded. It says don't be unequally yoked. That's right. It says don't call good bad and bad good. How many know we're seeing that right now in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Yes. And you know what? It's because Christians don't stand up. Yeah. Oh, don't talk about homosexuality. Ouch. Come on, tell the truth. Listen, God calls it an abomination. Yes. Amen. He's a healer. See, he can change anything. But he said don't ordain them as pastors. Yeah. 
How many know that that's an abomination to God? Yes. Right. Yes. Well, you know, Pastor, that's really rough. Well, listen. When I get to heaven, God ain't going to call me on the carpet for not telling you. God ain't going to make me clean floors or clean toilets. How many know I clean toilets at home now? I don't want to do that when I get to heaven. And you know what? If you read Revelation, there's going to be commerce in heaven. There's going to be jobs. There's going to be work that we do. It says blessed in here in James. It says blessed is the man who endures for when he's endured, he'll get the crown of life. How many know that that crown is for now. That's right. That crown is for now. Yes. See what you're doing, Kim, and you're you've been hosting this thing. This is where God's called you. This is where you've been faithful. And every time there's a meeting, you got a crown. Yes. You have a crown. You may not even realize it. You may say, man, this is getting to be a drag. This is getting to be really hard. But you know what? You're getting a crown. Yes. And and you know what that means? That means that you're not going to have to drive a 50 Chevy. That doesn't mean you're going to have to live in a, a $200 a month hotel. Or, 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 you know what? God wants to bless you with the crown of life. Yes. Yes. You know, if I went to the doctor and he come driving up in a 52 Chevy all dented up and got out with Holy Levi's. Of course, they're pretty fashionable now. But got out with Holy Levi's and grease all over him. You know what? He's going to do brain surgery. I think I'd be looking for another doctor. Amen. But you know what? When pastors come driving a new car or a new pickup or they got a little bit of gold on or they got a little ring on, I got that in Israel, by the way. It says I can do all things through Christ. <laughs> Amen. But when they see a pastor drive up and he's got a nice car, beautiful wife like bling. Amen. Right, Michelle? Michelle like bling too. Amen. Yeah. They guys scare me to death when they... Get together and they say, or something about, I'm going to charm and charm it. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. But you know what? That's the deal. You get these crowns in life and you can live the kind of life yeah. yes. that God died for you to have. Yes. But you can't walk around in fear and you can't walk around judging other people. That's right. And you can't walk around calling your brother's names and sticking swords in their back and, and eating chicken on the morning and fried pastor for dinner. You know, you can't do that. You know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians? It's 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, 14 through 20. It says you have many teachers in Christ, but not many fathers. Not many fathers. What's significant about a father? A father is somebody that's been there and done that. Yeah. Not somebody that's spent all their time in seminary and just wants to tell you about what God does. He wants to tell you how he did it. Amen? Yeah. Which leads me to my book. All right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, that book was written by Janice Richards. And uh, I suggest if you have a problem, if, or if anybody in your family or you know somebody that has a problem, by that book. There are scriptures in there that talk about the things that we went through and how we got through them. And, and you can see that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. That's enough of the book. But, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Buy it. I think it's uh, $150. Well, we've got it marked down. It's got it marked down to $15. I think it's We're slicing it right on down. Amen. <laughs> But listen to this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I like this one. Keep your finger in James. You won't be in that hanging out there. 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 14. Oh, 14. Second. 
First Corinthians 4.14. 4, 14, 4. Sometimes I do that with my check. <laughs> I don't want to go any further without one. Uh, anyway, it says, listen, it says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you. See, there's that, that thing where the bond servants pull away from the, their leaders, from their, from their people. Amen. It says, though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Through the gospel. The good news. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. Um, imitate, imitate me. For this reason I sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere and in every church. Now some are puffed up. That means religious. How many know a religious spirit is formed without power? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. A religious spirit will eat up a church. It will divide a church. People say, well, you know, when this Holy Spirit comes, there's always division. Well, that's true. Because the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Even to the division of the soul and the spirit that joins in the heart. Brother. As a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen? So there's going to be division any way you go, but... You know that religious spirit causes breakups and it causes pastors to quit the ministry. It causes a lot of things because, well, we'll read on here. It says, I teach every word in every church. Now some have become puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly. And if, if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Come on. See, the kingdom of God is not all about power, our word, it's about the power that we display to those out there that are lost. Yes, Come on, that's yeah. right on. I walked out of here and, and we were worshiping and there was a couple sitting at this booth and he said, bless you, brother. Uh, I felt like saying, well, come on in, man. Come on in. See, we got to get it outside the walls. That's right. yes. We got to get it outside yes. the walls. Yeah. Come on. Hallelujah. James chapter 2. Let's go to James chapter 2. 14. What does it profit, brethren, if someone says he has faith and not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute and da of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but do not give them the things which are needed for the body, with which with well, that does it profit. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself does not have works. Does not have works is dead. Faith without works is dead. That's right. Are you following? Yeah. Faith without works is dead. And you know we're Christians. we we are Christians. We're we're called. We're ordained by God. And you know what? We need to act like we're ordained by yes, God. That's right. <clears throat> Go to Isaiah 61. I'm going to share that with you. We're probably running out of time here. Are you guys ready to go home? No. Not when you're getting good food, brother. Isaiah 61. You know, this, this was our mandate. In fact, this is where we got the name of our ministry. Mashiach Ministries mean the anointed. Mashiach. Mashiach is where they got the Christos, the anointed one, Jesus Christ. So we called our ministry Mashiach Ministries. Amen? And here's what it says. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, yeah. to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the opening of the prisons for those who were bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and they and the vengeance of our God, <clears throat> to comfort all who mourn in Zion, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of mourning for the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness and planted, and the planted of, of the Lord that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild.
rebuilt. Say rebuilt. rebuilt. See, this is where I think this anointing comes that we're supposed to begin to stand up and take it out. It says, and they shall rebuild the old ruins, and they shall rise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined city, cities and the desolations of many de generations. See, God has called us to go into this place where it's not always easy. He said, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. But he says, listen, I'll be with you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You ever hear those dumb prayers? People stand up and say, oh God, would you be with me today? Yeah. How many know God said it? I don't know how many times in the Bible, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But we'll spend 40 minutes in a prayer meeting saying, oh God. Come on, brother. <laughs> Amen. That means we don't have nothing better to say. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Oh, God, if it be your will, will you heal my grandma? Come, Come on. God says, by my stripes, you are healed. Yes. Come on. Amen. Not you should be, would be, or could be. says you are healed. Come on. Amen. But you know what it takes, church? And I heard it here today. And you guys have got it. You just need to be motivated. You need to be... You need to be pushed out. You need to, you know what? The church of Jesus Christ never did anything until they, they went out. Until they started persecuting. How many know that right now that's exactly what's happening to Christians? Yes. They're being persecuted. They're being their heads are cut off. They're being they're, all kinds of things are happening to Christians. How many know that it's time we wake up and look around? Yeah. You know what? I, I, I go to some meetings sometimes and I hear people say. I don't sound like to watch the news. <laughs> Praise God. Somebody asked you. better watch the news. Yes. Yes. It might be your first clue to duck. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Even FTV. <laughs> no, it's right. It's right. It's right. See, we we, we don't want to watch the news because that, that's too negative. How many know that we have to know what's negative right. so we can pray that's the positive? Right. That's right. So we can do the positive. If we don't know what's negative, yeah. how are we going to do what's positive? <laughs> it's like saying, well, I don't need to read the Bible. The pastor will teach me everything I need to know. No way. You'd be in real trouble. Yeah, let me tell you, especially in my church. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I got some teachers in my church. Amen. God. Listen, go to go to first Corinthians. See if we can get this one right here. Verse verses First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Let's just start here in chapter two. Well, let's start right here and. Chapter 1, verse 26. And you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world, the things that are despised of God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. See, God says that we can call things that aren't as though they are. Yeah. Well, I don't like this drug situation in our country. Then we begin to declare and decree right. that we don't have a drug problem yeah. in our country. Yeah. Yeah. And when we see somebody with a drug problem, we don't run away from them. That's right. We go up to them. Yeah. You know when God put my office in San Francisco on Turk and Taylor, right in the heart of the Tenderloin? Yeah. I was on the eighth floor up there, and and it was a setup from God because I'm gonna pay $150 a month for that office suite. Oh wow! Yeah, and $90 a month to park behind the, the theater there, that's just unheard of. Usually it's 500 a month to park and two or three thousand for a suite, for an office suite. But I was taking care of their roofs up, and so yeah. they cut me a deal, and me and the guy was a Turkish guy, uh, Tolu was his name, um, Karhaman Tolu was his name. We got to be friends. And he said, well, give me a deal on the room. But you know what? Every day I walked through 
those transvestites, those homosexuals, those mm -hmm. drug addicts, those alcoholics. And, and you know what? I, I've seen them. I've seen God work like you wouldn't believe. One time he told me, I walked by this guy who was laying on the street. I was going to my office about 5 in the morning. And he's laying on the street. Man, he's just like stinking, you know. And, and uh, I mean, bad. And, and I'm, I'm walking by him, you know, going to my office. And, and I get upstairs. And, or I, actually, when I was walking by him, the Lord says, Hope, put your hand under his chin, raise up his face, and tell him that I love him. That's right. Wow. I mean, no. <laughs> Wait a minute, man. No. <laughs> So I just keep walking, you know, I just, I get up, go on the elevator, go upstairs, and that's when me and Teresa were dating, you know, and, and so I, I call her on the phone, and I spend a lot of time on the phone, amen. And, and I said, you know, the silliest thing, man, I was walking by this guy, and the Lord told me to lift up his chin and tell him that he loves him. There's a pause on the phone, Teresa said, you better get back down there and do that. Come on, Teresa. I said, all right. So, man, I, I walked all the way back to the parking lot, you know, and I walked by him again, and I'm looking, and then I turn around to the parking lot, and I walk back, and I thought, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and I, I reached down, and I picked him up, his chin up, and I said, you know something, brother? The Lord tells me to tell you that he loves you. Amen. And you know what? This guy started weeping. He started crying. And, and you know what? He had wine sores on, you know, where his pant leg was pulled up like this. You could see big wine sores on his legs and arms and stuff. And you know, when I got done talking to that man, those wine sores had shrunk down to there are just a little bitty scab. Jesus. You know how the new flesh, you can see the new flesh around the scab and the heels? God healed that right in front of my face. Right in front of my face. You know, when God asks us to do something that we're not sure we want to do, we need to do it. We need to do it. And if you're lucky like me, you'll put a partner in there that suggests that you go back and do it. Amen. Hallelujah. But anyway, listen here what it says. Corinthians chapter 2, go to verse 6. This is where I know you guys are at because I heard it with my own ears today. It says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers that are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. How many know what the mystery is? God gives it up in Colossians chapter 1. It says, the mystery that's been hidden from all ages is what? Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. See, if the so it, 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 this mystery. But we speak wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained. Set apart for us, you and me that are in this room today. For our glory. Which none of the rulers in this age knew. Because if they had known they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. How many know the devil would have done everything he could? There's a, there's a good example of God. Of the devils not being omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. See, he can't read your all's mind. Amen. Amen to that. He can't read your mind. He can study what you do because he's been doing it for millions of years. He can study just by the way you look, by the way you act, what you're going to do next. But he doesn't have the capacity to know what God's going to do next. And that's God reveals it to him. You follow me? But then in verse 9 it says, But it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for those who love Him. See, everybody in this room loves God today. Amen. Everybody in this room loves God today. Because I heard it in your voice. I heard it when you spoke in tongues. But it says God has revealed it to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man which are in him, even so no one knows the things of God, except the Spirit of God. That means you've got to get the Holy Spirit in the people that don't have the Holy Spirit. That's your job. That's our job, is to transmit what we've been given. Are you following me? See, the church can't transmit something they don't have. It says that now, Paul, it's anonymous. We use that at the ranch. It says you can't transmit something you don't have. That's right. So if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't transmit it. That's right. Remember earlier when I was praying, I said, let us change the atmosphere and yes. the climate. Yes. Yeah. 
How many know that down in Florida there's an atmosphere and a climate change where it very seldom ever is cold? See, we have that same capacity. We have the capacity to change the atmosphere if we know the Spirit. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit is from God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in the world, not not in world, not in words which the world, which words which man's wisdom teaches. Excuse me, but with the Holy Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. See, if you can't, if you don't have the Spirit in you, you can't understand spiritual things. If the Holy Spirit isn't in you and active, and somebody tells you about a healing, or that you're you're ready to receive your healing, you're not going to be able to receive it because it's spiritually discerned. That's right. You guys getting tired? No. No. Oh. Are you? These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of, of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Yes. Come on. Yes. Then it says in chapter 3, it says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? That's true. How many know that in the church today, there's a lot of striving, yeah. there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of unforgiveness, there's a lot of one-upsmanship, there's a lot of who's going to be this, who's going to be that. Uh -huh. And you know what, there's not a whole lot of doers, but hearers That's of it. the word. You know what, guys? It's up to us. It's up to us. And we're going to pray a prayer. We're going to pray today that the Holy Spirit begin to fill us up. Amen? Amen. Amen. And it's going to shine a new light on the things of God. That we're not going to be afraid of the things of God. We're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit so we can discern the things of this. Yes. Right. Yes. You know what we do at the ranches? Every Monday, we started this about a year or two ago. We do coffee and a prayer down at the corner of 95 and Highway 50 in Silver Springs. And rain or shine, whether it's snowing or raining or whatever, the boys set up a, uh, and the, some of the people in the church, they set up a little uh, tent type thing, a little covering, and they have a coffee pot, and they have signs that says coffee and free coffee and a prayer. And you know, when they first started doing that, Judges say Silver Springs is where the independent thinkers live. Amen. I mean, it, it used to be called the, M, the arm pit in the back. We're trying to change that. Amen. Amen. But these people would drive by and they'd see us out there at that coffee and a prayer. And, you know, they'd be giving us these signs like, you're number one. I think that's what yeah. we were trying to say. <laughs> but you know what? They, they give us these dirty looks and tell us we're number one and everything. And you know what? We just kept on doing coffee and a prayer. And then we had this pastor that, that uh, him and his sister were going to Reno. She was going to have her uh, leg amputated because she had no circulation in her leg and lower knee. And so uh, he stopped and he thought, uh, what's his name? I can't. Anyways, a pastor. <laughs> Yosef, yeah. He stops and he's like, well, I'll just get coffee and I'll have these kids pray for me. So he did. And one of the girls stuck their hand inside the window of his, where his sister was sitting and put her hand on the, on the leg that was giving her trouble. Mm -hmm. And they prayed over that girl. And by the time they got to Reno, they took him into the cardiologist or whoever that is. There was absolutely nothing wrong with that. So he came, he came the next Sunday to our church. His, his church started at 10.30. Ours started at 10. So he came and he said, Hey, Pastor Rick, can I give a quick testimony? 
have just a few minutes. I said, sure, he goes. And he got up and, and testified to how the healing happened right there at yeah. Coffee and a Prayer. Yeah. And how many know now that people drive by there and they wave at those yes, kids? Jesus. And they honk Amen. their horn yes. and, and trucks honk and they pull into that parking lot and they'll get out of their big old trucks and go over there and get prayer. And, yes. and, and you know what? We're changing the atmosphere yes. in, in that county. We're yes. changing the atmosphere. Yes. And we're changing the Jesus. climate to where, you know yes. what? It's going to be, you know, first off, let me... I'm trying to hurry here, but you know, when we first went to Silver Springs, Nevada, I thought, what are you taking me to the desert for, Lord? I mean, I lived in California most, I was born here. I was born in L.A., lived in Northern California most all my life. My business was in Rio Vista. You know, I was used to a lot of grass, a lot of water, everything, and boom, here I am in Silver Springs. And so, I asked him one day at my desk, in kind of desperation, <laughs> Why are you taking me to Silver Springs? And he said, well, listen, take out your map. Take out your atlas, he said. So I took my atlas out of my desk. I set it on my desk, and he says, look at Silver Springs. I said, okay, here's Silver Springs. He said, where is that in conjunction to all the cities around you? Come on. I said, well, it's right in the middle, around Reno, Sparks, Minden, Gardnerville, Shears. All of those towns, Silver Springs, geographically, is right in the middle. And then he says... What the, what's silver stand for in the Bible? I said, well, what well, stands for redemption? Yeah. Come on. He said, that's yeah. right. He said, what county are you in? I said, Lion County. Come on. He said, that's the Lion of Judah County. Come on. Yeah. In the heart of Redemption Springs. Yeah. Then I said, okay, God, it makes sense. Yeah. How many know you couldn't have planned that? No. <laughs> we couldn't have planned that deal. No. I mean, you know what I'm saying? No. But God is, is using us just like He's going to use you. Amen. Just like it's going to go forth from here. Amen. You know, if you get up and you're willing to do what God calls you to do. Yes, right. If you're just willing to do what He's called you to do. Yes. And you know what? When you fall into various trials and you start getting angry or you start getting mad or, or you start getting resentment over stupid stuff that can destroy you and your ministry and, and your relationship with God. You know what? You need to get down on your knees and pray. Come on, brother. That's you need to pray to God. Not pray to man. That's right. Not pray to the pastor. But go pray to God. That God will give you the power to find the grace to forgive those that you have unforgiveness. And you know what you'll find? You'll find that your whole ministry your whole relationship with God will change. Your whole ministry, your whole life will change. You know, women, you can do it with your husband. Husbands, you can do it with your wives. You can begin to forgive them. It can start right there at home. God gave the commission. He said, Jerusalem, Judea, and then Samaria. And then to all the areas of the earth. Amen? It starts right in our church. By standing up and saying, hey, Pastor, Pastor Goodfield, amen? <laughs> we need to get the Holy Spirit in here. Come on. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We need to get the Holy Spirit in here. Yes. That's right. yeah. How many know that that's the kind of boldness the church needs? Yes, yes. yes. come on, amen. brother. Yes. Amen. So stand up yes. and let's pray. I'm going to close right here. Yes. You know, when I recommitted my life to Christ in 1980, I didn't know what it was to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand what it meant. It says on the day of Pente and when the day of Pentecost had come, how many know that Pentecost means 50, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, the Spirit was poured out on all flesh. Yeah. Come on. Amen? Amen. Amen. How many know Mary was in that upper room? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Along with some other She was a tongue talker. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. You don't hear that yeah. too much in the Catholic Church. Church. Right. Church. Right. Church. Right. Church. Mary was spirit-filled. Amen? Yeah. 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 Come on, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. But it says that they received power. Yeah. That when the Holy Spirit came yeah. upon them. And listen, that's when the power, when you are able to submit to God. That's right. When you're able to submit, because you can't submit without the power of the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is read the Gospels. Come on. 
When Jesus went to the cross, the disciples went to the boats. That's right. Amen? Amen? They didn't hang around. They, didn't, they walked with Him for three and a half years, and they didn't believe. Are you following me? Spiritual things are, are discerned spiritually. Yes. By and through the Holy Spirit.